From zinnias to squash, we're going to take a look at great things you can grow from seed, and it all starts right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. Now in today's show, we're out here at the Garden Home Retreat in the vegetable garden, and we're busy getting all the summer vegetables planted. We're actually beginning to harvest some. So this is all about bringing the harvest into the kitchen. But not just that, we're gonna talk about some beautiful flowers like these gorgeous zinnias you can grow from seed. I consider these a feast for the eyes. Today, we'll talk about growing plants from seeds. You know, it's really not as difficult as you might think. And I'll share with you some interesting tidbits about watermelon, squash, and other items I have growing out here. For instance, did you know that the largest watermelon on record weighed just shy of 300 pounds? Now, that's a whopper. Just like these guys growing in a watermelon field in Hope, Arkansas, better known as the watermelon capital of the world. Let's check in with a local farmer who's growing some prize winners. There's a reason why watermelons are so popular in the hot, steamy south. You see, they are 92% water, something our body needs when the temperature reaches up there around 100. Some of the largest watermelons on record have been grown here in Hope, Arkansas. And every year, this town comes out to celebrate the harvest. We stopped in and visited with Lloyd Bright and his family's watermelon farm to learn a little bit more about this sweet treat from nature. My dad and I were growing the regular kind of melons. He had learned how to grow big melons from the other growers. And in 1973, we tried the Carolina Cross variety and did well with it. Got into the watermelon competition. For us, it became a good good hobby. We enjoyed doing that together. The, the largest melon that we've grown in this field weighed 268. We've grown two Guinness records in this field. Welcome to Hope, Arkansas and the Watermelon Festival. Back in the I'm 70s, festivals the were set up to promote hope, also to promote the melon industry. It's run continuously since. A visitor at the festival will have a wide variety of foods. The, probably the best competitive events will be the watermelon eating contest and also the seed spitting contest. But there's something going on from Thursday afternoon up through Sunday noon. Watermelon growing is, is my hobby and, and obviously the watermelons I like best are, are the large ones. And to me it's a real challenge and a lot of fun and occasionally you get a Guinness record out of it. This little melon is one called Mickey Lee, and it's an icebox sized melon, meaning that it doesn't take up a lot of room in your refrigerator. These are delicious little melons, but I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. If you plant Mickey Lee, you need to know that the vines will grow all over the place. We planted two or three hills back here behind the fence, and the vines are just spilling over this stone wall into the orchard, and just look at all the watermelons down through here. Plant some of these and have a little fun. What we're doing today, here's some seed. Look, there you go, McLean. There you go, Maddie. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to do is grow some gourds in a big container. I thought it would be fun if we did one container for you, Maddie, and okay. one container for McLean. Yeah, that'd be fair. And we've got a big pot here, and I, okay. I've knocked the bottom out of it. So, well, I've already had a chip in the bottom, so I thought, okay. okay, we'll go ahead and knock the rest of the hole in the bottom. And I set it here in the bed, and what'll happen is when those gourds start putting out roots. They can go all the way through the soil here okay. and into the soil in this bed and they can get really big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, you guys go ahead and open up your packets of, of seed okay. and I'm going to pour some soil in here. So glad y'all could come help. Okay. All right, look at that soil. Doesn't that look good? 
Mm -hmm. If you were a gourd, you'd be jumping up and down with excitement. Yay! Now, gourds are really cool. They're in the sort of pumpkin and watermelon mm -hmm. family, all those sort of melon shapes. Yes. But mainly squashes and mm -hmm. pumpkins, or they're all cousins. Yeah. Yep, so let's dump some of those gourd seed out in your hand. There you go. McLean, dump some out in your hand and let's have a look. Bring them up here and let's hold, hold it over the soil so if we drop some, they'll land here in the soil. Yeah, come on up here. Oh, look at them. There's some big ones and there's some small ones there. All right, now, what I'd like to do is I would like, these gourds grow on long, long vines, okay? Okay. So what I've done is I have made a little teepee out of three sticks okay. like this. And I'm gonna put this like, just like this. Yeah. Okay. It's just something for the gourds to grow up on. Okay. So now what I need for you all to do is let's drop some seed all along the edge. Okay. Let's go all the way around. McLean, why don't you do that side and Maddie, you do this side and we'll put them all in here. That's right. All the different sizes. See the different sizes. Let's mm -hmm. put some over there. And then let's push them into the ground. All right, let's get them evenly distributed okay. and push them into the ground about a half an inch, okay? Okay. Now, what is amazing about these gourds, as hot as it is, because it's already summer, you can feel it today, these will germinate, which means they'll begin to push out of the ground right. with the top part of the gourd and the root going down in about 10 days or less. I think less because it's so hot. There's one there, push that one in. All right, let's push this one over here. Very good. Now, I think we've got them all covered. You guys are great. Now, let's see here. I think we better water it. I've got this big bucket of water. Okay. And I'm gonna put some water on it like this. And in no time, these things will start coming up and they'll be growing all over the place. Wow, that is big! Look how fast they grow! They are. Look, it's taller than you already, and it's only 15 days since we planted them. That was how fast! How do you feed them? Oh, well, we've just been using the organic fertilizer. There's so much good stuff in the soil here, and we keep it, the soil moist, and they love that. So when do the little gourds start coming up? Well, the little gourds will start appearing in about another couple of weeks. They produce okay. a flower first, and then the little gourd appears. I've got some over here. Come on, I'll show you. I planted them about a month ago. Come on. Okay. Okay, now this is the gourd I was telling you about. Look how much it's grown. And see, here are the white flowers up here. It's growing up in the tomato. And down here you can see there's a smaller gourd. And then this one is already getting some size on it. What I like to do is I like to take a sharp object and make a shape on it. You can do all kinds of funny things. I'm going to make a funny face here. Now this is a project that I've done in the past. And you see, as the cut on the gourd heals, it produces a type of scar tissue that leaves behind the pattern that you've created or your name. It's a fun thing to do with lots of extra gourds. Another project you may want to try at home with your gourds is to make a birdhouse. Now, the steps are pretty simple. All you do is take a dried birdhouse gourd. The larger, the better, like this one. You'll want to wash them and sand them before making a hole in the front by using a round drill like this. You'll need to reach in and scrape out all of the insides, and you might want to save a few of those seeds. They look like little pieces of paper. You see, you can plant these next year. Now sand down the rough edges of the opening and drill in three drain holes in the bottom. Then drill two holes in the top, and this is where you'll put a string in for hanging the gore. Now you can paint them if you wish, or you can spray them with a water sealer. You can also polish gourds. You can create some beautiful and stylish fall decorations. To preserve them, there are a few things you may find helpful. Gourds should be completely dry, and you can do this simply by air drying them in a well-ventilated area like your garage. When you do this, you may find that crust and mold appear on them. This is normal. Just wash them in warm, soapy water with a steel wool pad. This will remove the residue. Once they're clean, wipe them with a cloth and let them dry thoroughly. For these large ones, Lightly sanding them with a fine sandpaper prepares them for the next step, which can be painting, varnishing, or waxing. I like to bring out the natural tones in these gourds. What works for me and gives them a nice shine is just an ordinary paste wax. Now for the smaller gourds, I prefer to paint them, but I always dip them in varnish first. This keeps the paint from being completely absorbed. 
Now there's another type of gourd that's interesting. It's the loofah gourd. You've probably seen these in bath and beauty shops, but it's really easy to grow these. and You can make your own loofah. Now, believe it or not, all of the vines you see here grow from one plant that I planted back in May, and now it's covered the entire trellis. And now that it's later in the season, it's beginning to set fruit. These squash-like gourds are best known as the bath sponge gourd. You've probably seen their fibrous skeletons in fancy bath shops. A lot of people think that these sponges actually come from the ocean, but it's just a gourd you can grow in your own garden. Now, if you want to produce a lot of these, I recommend you get a jump on the season by starting the seedlings indoors and then transplanting them into the garden as soon as temperatures warm in the spring. If you decide to grow some, you'll want to give them plenty of room to grow. These vines of mine have grown easily 20 feet or more. I either weave them back into the trellis or just cut them off. As you can see, because of their vigorous growth, loofah sponge vines can make an excellent summer screen if you plant them on a fence. I think it's interesting that the young fruit is edible. You see, this vine is a member of the squash family, so it shouldn't be any surprise that these taste like zucchini when picked young and tender like these. Now, I know this looks like we're doing a little science experiment out here, but we're not. I really just want to show you a method that I learned from my grandmother Smith about dealing with those seed that are difficult to germinate. One of the reasons why is they often have a really hard outer covering. And one of the most difficult is okra. One of my favorite okra varieties is the Clemson spineless. They create such tender pods. Now, what I like to do is take the okra seed and just soak it overnight in buttermilk. Now, if you don't have the stomach for buttermilk, you can do it in water but I just love to drink buttermilk, and it's fun to do just what I'm doing here. Now what happens is the lactic acid breaks down the covering of the okra, and it'll germinate so much faster. I have to admit, one of the things I enjoy about growing plants from seed is that you can experiment with so many different varieties. Now one thing I like to do is to plant vegetables in containers. When I pick seed, I look for the word patio on the seed pack, which typically means the plant is a smaller growing form, a diminutive size but produces lots of vegetables. For instance, take a look at this. This is a little eggplant called Hansel. Cute little thing, isn't it? This is about two weeks old, and this is about two and a half weeks older than this. So you can see during the hot summer how quickly they will grow. Now, what I would do in a container this size is just plant one eggplant. In a container like this, I would plant one of these little tomatoes. Now, if you're choosing tomatoes and you're not sure if it's a patio type or not, at least choose one that's determinant, not indeterminant. Now, the difference there is determinant has a determined size. It'll grow so many feet long. Indeterminate, they'll just keep growing and there's where you get the name tomato vines because they really grow like a vine. Now, when I prepare the soil, one of the things I want you to know about in a container like this, start with a really good potting mix, one that is specifically blended for container gardening. And I like to use a little water retentive polymer mixed into this, all right? That helps keep the moisture consistent in the container and also put a saucer under here. And you wanna feed these regularly because you're constantly going to be washing the fertilizer through the container. So, hey, who says you have to have acres and acres to grow fresh vegetables? All you need are some big clay pots like this and a few vegetable seeds. Give it a try. I'm gonna admit something to you. I'm a hopeless pack rat. Ask anybody in my office. I've even got periodicals and magazines going back to the late 1970s. Hey, you never know when you're gonna need this stuff. I also have every piece of porcelain, ceramic, and furniture that my family ever handed down to me. You know, I just can't get rid of it. And the same is true in the garden. You see, I just can't bear to let things go. Fall leaves get composted and become next spring soil amendments. And I use twigs in all sorts of ways in the garden. They're great for recycling into supports for plants in the form of teepees and tutors. And if there's a way to use every part of a plant, then that just endears it to me even more, like sunflowers. 
Chances are you've not only enjoyed looking at the dramatic flowers, but you've also eaten its seeds and used its oil in cooking. Is it any wonder why these are called sunflowers? Few names are as fitting. The bloom actually looks like a little miniature sun. And as you might guess, for these little guys to perform well, they need full hot sun. You can't get much more American than these. They're natives that have been hybridized into some astonishing giants. Some of them can produce flower heads at least 12 inches across. And then there are others that perhaps don't grow as large but make up for it with a beautiful array of colors. In the past, I've planted the big guys, but since my vegetable garden is small, they tend to overpower it. So this year, I planted this little dwarf variety called Sunspot. The scale of them seems to fit better. And when you mass them in a raised bed like I've done here, they can be quite a splash of color. I planted these from seed about six to eight weeks ago. I just planted four rows of them, spacing the seed a couple of inches apart. These are some of the showiest annuals you can grow. And since they're up and blooming so quickly, it's a good way to get children excited about gardening. And when the seed heads dry, they're a favorite of birds. I'm cutting a few of these blooms before they get too mature, so I can dry them. There's really nothing to it. Just cut as long a stem as you can and hang them upside down in a dry, well-ventilated place. They're ideal for using for fall arrangements. So as you can see, growing sunflowers provides you with color and beauty for your home and garden, not to mention providing an organic food source for the birds in your garden. Well, we've got a lot going on out here today. The concrete trucks are filling these concrete block cylinders full of concrete to strengthen the walls. The added support is for what's going to happen behind me. You see, between these two studio buildings and the house will be a reservoir that will be dug out and we'll collect rainwater. We'll actually harvest rainwater off these three buildings. It'll go into this tank underground and that water will be used to irrigate the flower and vegetable garden as well as the orchard. Now, what they'll do is come along here with some of that beautiful tumbled stone and veneer this back side of the wall so it'll look like an old farm place. It's really coming together. We talk a lot about the porches on this house as being outdoor living spaces or transitional spaces, and that means they're going to be furnished just as beautifully as the inside rooms. I took a lot of time in selecting the right exterior furnishings, just like I did with the interior chairs and tables. Now since this show is about seeds, I wanted to share with you a fun idea that I saw recently and reproduced in my garden home. A greenhouse is a natural place for starting seedlings during the cold months, but during the warm summer, you can just grow your seeds outdoors. So what can you do with this beautiful garden structure? How about creating a nice outdoor room that's an ideal place for relaxing? Today's photograph comes to us from Jenny in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and Jenny has a real challenge in her hands. Just look a little closer and you'll see the slope that she's trying to plant across the back of her garden. Now, as you can see, what Jenny's trying to do is cover the slope. Uh, she mentioned in her letter to me that she had planted, without much success, English ivy across the back of this. Now, the back of the house faces the west. If you know English ivy at all, you know that it likes uh, shade and plenty of moisture. So I think that the reason this wasn't successful is that the cultural requirements weren't met for the ivy. But I've got some ideas that I think will help. Now, I can't really tell what this fabric is, but I really do like these landscape fabrics. Um, they can help keep weeds down, they can keep moisture in, and they can actually help stabilize a slope like this and keep it from eroding. But what you want to do is not use black plastic, which is a common mistake because that doesn't allow water to percolate through or an exchange of oxygen and other essential elements. Now, let's assume that we take this black plastic away, we put a proper uh, weed fabric or landscape fabric across this, then what I would think about doing is maybe establishing a parameter up here with a low boxwood hedge right at the crest of the hill before it begins to slope. And then I would punctuate, since this faces the west, this with tulip poplars. It's a fast growing tree, makes a gorgeous shade tree, and I'd probably put five or six of them across here and just create a grove of poplars that would create a shady bank 
like that. Now, I wouldn't worry about planting anything on the slope. I would just cover it with hardwood mulch all the way down. And once these poplars took off and began to create some shade, then it could be underplanted with a ground cover. What I would recommend is one called Winter Creeper. It'll take the sun, it has a small leaf, uh, it will turn a beautiful bronze color in the fall, and the way you can keep it under control is just mow it each year. It makes it much thicker. Now, what she has here, it looks like either she's planted these little hollies or her neighbor has. What I would do is add some more of these hollies and sort of fill in so I create a boundary here on my property line and let this evergreen hedge grow up. And I think with that, it could really help solve your problems, Jenny. I hope this works for you. I just can't tell you how enthusiastic I am over this bean. This is an asparagus bean. Just look at this bundle I've already picked. And you can pick a bundle like this in no time. They just come off like so. What is so great about this bean is it's delicious and prolific. What I do is gather them in a bundle like this, take them into the kitchen, wash them off, and then just cut them on the diagonal, stir fry them or cook them as you would an ordinary green bean. I love them cooked with little new potatoes. Now if you grow asparagus beans, you've got to have a trellis high enough so that it can produce these beautiful long beans and you can come along and pick them. Now I put this horizontal piece of board across here between the posts at about six feet. Next year I'm going to raise it because you can see they're piling up on top. And I ran one at the bottom here. You can see it just down here. And between, I just took some ordinary twine, just garden twine, went up and down, up and down in a zigzag pattern. And that's what the little tendrils attached to. And they grew straight up in a matter of about three weeks. These will produce these gorgeous beans all summer long. Okay, throughout this show we focused on summer flowers and summer vegetables, but what about some of those spring flowering favorites? Some of them you have to actually start in the winter, such as sweet peas. I love sweet peas, but you know, in my garden in Zone 7, it warms up so quickly, you have to plant them very early, and that's exactly what I did this year. I planted them in the greenhouse in late January. I have to get a jump start on them, so I pop them up in large containers in the greenhouse. When the threat of frost has passed, then we move them out into the vegetable garden so they can finish growing and blooming in the pots before it gets too hot. We're using a variety here called Winter Elegance. The Elegance series will bloom even in the short days of winter, which is a problem with a lot of other varieties. They won't bloom until the days get long. But the real benefit of the Elegant series is the fragrance. It's just amazing. Like the okra seeds we saw earlier in the show, I should recommend to you that if you plant sweet peas, you soak them in water for about 12 hours so that outer coating will begin to soften. I promise you'll get better germination if you do this. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, I think the thing to remember is Never underestimate something as small as a seed because great things can grow from it. And it's amazing what a small plot of ground like this can produce in one growing season. I hope today's show has helped you get over your seed starting phobias. Now get out there and grow something. You'll enjoy it. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Hey, I've got a cornucopia of fruit and berries in this show. Be inspired by the bounty in the garden and then bring it indoors with recipes and other ideas that can help you blur the lines between inside and out, from strawberries and blueberries to grapes and figs. I hope we'll open your eyes to growing and enjoying fresh fruits and berries.